welcome everybody to this um, live webinar that is going to be recorded and so you may be watching this after the event. Um, we're hoping to be joined by a few people um, live uh, on the panel today just to um, help us when we're having our little discussion about the future of education um, and ask pertinent questions and support us. But um, we may or may not have some people um, asking questions. So we're really just here to have a discussion between two like-minded, progressive um, educationists. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right term to use, but people who are passionate about personal development, especially for young people, um, about the future of education, where we should go next and how we're gonna get there really, I think. Um, and that comes in the context of our stories, I think, because I'm always a great believer in the, the, the story of what made us who we are today is, is it leads you know, where we want to go in the future. So I'm going to start off by asking Alison, if you wouldn't mind to just share a bit about your story and how you got to sit in here today talking about education reform, your, your history as a head teacher and, and such like. So do you tell us more? Yeah, so um, I... Uh, I was lucky in that I was born um, in South Africa, but then we moved around quite a lot. So I was, I was educated in a school in major deprivation as a Cape Colored kid. Um, I went to an international school. In, I, 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 did, I dipped into international schools as a kid in places like Botswana and so on. Um, I went through the girls' grammar school in the north of Ireland, uh, which was highly aspirational. Um, I went to the Protestant primary school in the north of Ireland, so I had a, ta a taste of faith schooling. Um, and then I uh, ended up in England, where I did my A-levels at a sixth form college in um, in uh, an area, it was a, an area, it was in Parnham, Missouri, which is um, quite an affluent area. So that kind of colours the way in which I see the world and see education. And uh, what I do is very much based on my experience of going through those different education systems. Um, and the one thread that wove them together was, well, there were two threads. The first one was lack of aspiration. Mm. You know, you, you were just kind of tolerated, you were there. Uh, people had uh, stereotypical expectations of you just based on how you presented externally. Um, but the other thing that was really interesting in all of those systems is that they were just delivering an education system as laid out. There was no challenge, there was no excitement, there was no forward thinking, uh, there was no, um, no real understanding about uh, child-centred education and what success looks like. Um, and, you know, I survived, I came out of it okay. Um, I know that I didn't belong in any of those places and belonging to me was a crucial thing. Um, and I was also a very uh, quiet, introverted child, I had delayed speech for a while, um, and all of those sorts of things. So, that, so I then wanted to go into teaching so that I could, um, I could offer, I wanted to be the teacher I never had. I wanted to be present for the quiet girls who get overlooked where people have low aspiration because they're quiet. You're so busy checking out the noisy, gregarious crowd that often what is expected of quieter pupils is, um, yeah, there isn't a great deal of expectation because they kind of think, oh, they, they've been good and they're getting on with their work rather than how can we challenge their thinking and listen to what they have to say because they've got something to contribute. So I wanted to be a teacher for those, those pupils. Um, and then um, I did that. I, I, I really loved teaching um, and I always will love teaching. Um, and I know that I impacted on those pupils. In fact, just um, over the weekend, someone came on Twitter and sort of said, Alison, Alison Creel. And then he, and he sort of said, I'm really sorry I was so naughty and, you know, I didn't behave well for you. And I only thought, I only remember good things about him. 
And he was there kind of saying, I'm sorry I bled on your suede jacket. And it was just really, do you know what? And he's now, he's 40. And the fact that he still wants to connect and we had that kind of banter like he was still in year five or whatever was just really special. And that made me feel like, yeah, I'm still the teacher. I'm still his teacher from that time. Um, And then when I went into headship, I was absolutely determined to build a school, which was about... um, which put children at the centre of what we were trying to do, where we wanted to understand what success looked like in a broader way rather than a very narrow definition of educational success. Um, I wanted to be aspirational for every single child. I wanted to be inclusive for every single child, um, inclusive of every single child. And I also wanted every child to feel like they belonged, they had something to contribute. They were uh, truly valued for who they were, despite all of the differences. Um, so that's why we've got the conversation now, because obviously I did things differently. I didn't necessarily want to put, you know, we kind of played by the rules in a way. We did bits of the national curriculum, but we were so much more. Um, and of course, that got me into a lot of trouble because I wasn't following the conventional rules. Um, and then irritatingly enough, because of what we did in our school and the risks that we took. Um, Of course, children were successful. (laughs) And so instead of um, being beaten up, I came out of the system and left on a high because um, the children were successful, the staff were successful, the school was successful. Um, And uh, yeah, I survived um, Mm. the challenges of not following convention. Yeah, so it's so courageous to take on that challenge. It takes a lot of bravery to do that, but like, like we'll get on to you later on. You know the the outcomes for that courage are incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that story. It's, it's so it's so wonderful to hear the background behind it because I think it does colour what we go on to do in, as adults and, and what our futures have to hold for us as well. Wonderful. And um, for those of you, I and mean, we do have some participants with us today, it's really welcome um, along here today. We would love to have questions from you. So if anything kind of comes up that you'd really like to ask Alison or myself, please do pop it in the Q&A and we will get to that um, as we go through this afternoon. So, um, but it's lovely having you along today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, and I think most people will have come through kind of my network, so I'm, I'm hoping most people will know my story, but I'm just going to quickly run through that because I think that just helps as well get the balance um, and understanding of where we're coming from, because I think we come from a similar place. Um, so um, I'm neurodiverse. I have a diagnosis of dyslexia, um, and I really struggled in the education system, despite going through kind of the private system um, and being very privileged. I really struggled with discrimination because of my challenges to do with not only my literacy and um, actually was quite strong with my numeracy but actually my organizational skills which I recently found out to be my executive function skills the the skills that I use to um, regulate my emotions to organize my belonging to um, organize my thoughts on paper um, they really got me into a lot of trouble um, because of talking out of turn in the classroom saying things that I shouldn't do to people um, and I, I got bullied quite badly actually at school as well because I didn't have that response inhibition that ability to not say the thing <laughs> that you maybe um, shouldn't say in, in that situation that kind of social awareness maybe as well um, which is all linked to our executive function skills so I, I came through the system um, feeling a bit downtrodden by it, um, culminated in, culminated in um, getting a 2-1 from Cambridge in geography, which was the hardest thing I ever did, um, but made me who I am today. Um, the discrimination I faced at Cambridge was quite criminal, really, <laughs> um, because people just couldn't understand how you could not be able to spell or organise your thoughts on paper, but yet verbally in a supervision or in a tutor group be able to really kind of argue a point well and really get get the understanding of the, of the content of, of what was being talked about. Um, so I left university vowing never to go into education again because I've been so bruised by it. Uh, went off and worked in the food industry for a few years and then I was taking a sabbatical and I was working in Uganda doing teaching English as a foreign language and I really fell in love with teaching. Um, 
came back after my sabbatical, did my PGC um, and loved my PGC. I love learning about learning and about teaching and, and about all of that. Went into the teaching profession and unfortunately suffered the same discrimination as a teacher um, from uh, people who didn't understand my neurodiversity, which was really hard at that stage to, to realize that things hadn't changed. Um, so I didn't stick around, unfortunately, in the teaching profession for long. Um, I decided that I would much prefer to work one on one with children who have my challenges and support them. So that's the work that I do now. Um, so I am committed to education and personal development, but not in the form of the system that it is at the moment, because I find it very troubling that it discriminates so much against neurodiverse people and people from all different backgrounds who don't fit the kind of common mold. Um, so that's where I'm coming from to this conversation, if that gives a bit of colour to everybody. Um, so I wanted to pick up on something you said earlier, um, Alison, which is something that's been occurring to me a lot recently, about that sense of belonging. We both talked, you talked about and used that word specifically, and I kind of mentioned it, kind of not feeling like I was fitting in um, throughout my education. Um, so do you want to elaborate a bit more on about the importance of belonging in terms of our personal development? Um, yeah, so if you belong, um, then you feel, it's really simple. If you feel like you belong and you um, are, it means that you feel like you're truly valued as you are. So you as someone with your, with dyslexia, if, if that was embra embraced, because there's so many positives to dyslexia. So the institutions that you were part of had a choice. They could either beat you up because of your organisational skills and the way in which you spell and, you know, your, the way in which you record things grammatically, um, which is what they do. It's really easy just to put a big red X against it and sort of say, that's the sign of failure. But the flip side of dyslexia is that you see the world differently and you have incredible creativity and um, you bring original thinking to the table and all of those sorts of things. Um, so of course you were probably beaten up because everybody thinks spelling is um, an indication of intelligence, which it isn't. Um, and, uh, and so that would have meant that you were made to feel like you didn't belong, you were a failure and all of those sorts of things. I have to say my daughter's dyslexic as well and incredibly successful because of it, in incredibly successful. She wouldn't be doing what she was doing, I'm pretty sure, if she wasn't dyslexic. So, you know, that's, that's my, my kind of view on the world. Um, and of course, if they'd sort of said to you, actually, Victoria, we know you're dyslexic, but this is, what, this is how we understand you learn, this is what we're going to help you do. And of course, um, you know, spanning is important and these things are okay, but this is how we're going to take care of that because we're going to capitalise on what you're really good at so that you can feel successful. You'd have come through the system feeling very differently about yourself because you knew you would have known that you were accepted for who you are. Um, I think that um, when I was a school leader, um, I um, began to have some ADHD traits. Um, and, do you know, it lends itself to school leadership mm. because of the way in which you engage with people, um, because of, um, you know, the fact that you can be really impulsive and you can react to things really quickly. And, um, you know, there's lots of spontaneity and creativity and all of that kind of stuff. You know, all of that is about leadership. Mm. Whereas when we look at people who are, I'm not, I, I'm, I haven't been diagnosed, but I definitely got some traits and I'm quite okay with it. <laughs> Um, and uh, but I was I actually think about this quite a lot. You know, what kind of leader would I have been if I didn't have some of those traits? Um, and so it's about embracing things and accepting the fact that we are all different. You know, our uniqueness is what makes us such wonderful people. And so if you say to somebody, actually, you can be a really good leader because you've got some of these traits, which means that you can do spontaneity and creativity um, and you, you're really good at connecting or bringing communities together because, you know, those are some of the positive traits, then maybe um, I would have felt differently as a leader. As a kid, um, I uh, 
was always made to feel like I didn't belong either because of my colour or because of the language that I spoke or the class that I was born into or the fact that I didn't, I didn't come from that country. Um, mm -hmm. So that whole thing of othering means that you spend an awful lot of time trying to fit in. And when you try to fit, fit in, um, there's a really nice diagram which shows that if you don't belong, you spend two thirds of your time trying to fit in. Mm. Instead of using to, in, instead of using all of that time to feel celebrated because of what you bring to that setting, um, and and that's the that's why belonging is so really really important. Um, and you know, then it sort of leads on to things like self acceptance, happiness, um, satisfaction, feeling you can take risks. You know, if you if you want children to uh, go out and become leaders, they have to learn failure and they need to be able to take risks. And we beat that out of everybody because we're so obsessed with getting green ticks and red X's and all of those sorts of things. And all of that sort of, you know, dovetails into what belonging feels like. So, yeah. So important. I've been doing a bit of kind of thinking recently about, you know, the work that I do with my neuroscience and and learning piece and how it fits in with with you know a lot of older or more established um kind of teaching ideas and and i always keep coming back to maslow's and i think we've talked about this before but maslow's hierarchy of needs has been around for goodness knows for how long but everyone's learned about it in their teacher training um we all know about it and uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it it is a kind of pyramid just google it if, if you're watching us now it's a pyramid and, and in order to get to the self-actualization the kind of personal development the reaching your potential you have to have your physical yeah, and mental needs uh, etc looked after in order to get to that point and you can't have one without the other and belonging is such an important part of that and it's put in there in maslow's hierarchy of needs and and yet we forget that. So we, yeah, we do focus on the kind of the physical, you know, the, have we have we eaten, you know, all those kind of things, free school meals and that kind of stuff. But we don't focus on that sense of belonging and that we can't go any further up the hierarchy unless we belong. And so there's a blockage for, for people. And that's why often people, you know, in our community, they just put, so the first time that they've ever had someone who really understands what it's like for, to, to be, that to have these challenges and, and belonging is such an important thing. And once they've got that to that stage and they feel that they are understood, then they can start to, to develop and to flourish and to be the person that they were meant to be. But if, if we don't, if they don't feel like they could belong, if they're understood that they're valued, then, the, then it doesn't happen or it's, it's slower to happen for sure. Um, so how did you foster belonging at your school? I'm really um, keen to hear like the practicalities of it. What did you do to make practicalities? Sure? Um, yeah, I'll go through those in it. Yeah, I'll, I'll share some of the things that we did, but the whole thing around Maslow is really interesting because that was done in 1942, so we knew about 42, it. 1942. It? Yeah, you know, 80 years. Um, and at that point, he put it in the middle, but I actually think it's more important than that mm. because we've evolved over 80 years. You know, if we want to say this is Maslow's, you know, this is Maslow's triangle, it wasn't that important, it's kind of in the middle. Um, then that's only because that was then and we're now 80 years on and uh, we understand the importance of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, self-esteem was the crux of everything that we wanted to do. I wanted the children, um, first of all, we wanted to celebrate their uniqueness. So it was the language that they brought. So rather than um, speaking English as an additional language, it meant that people were bilingual which was celebrated irrespective of what language they spoke because you know if you want to go out into the world being able to speak lots of different languages can only be a bonus rather than something to apologize for so it would have been as uh, simple as that it would have been things like um uh wanting to know wanting children to say this is who i am so understanding where they've come from who their family were um, so we wanted them to serve themselves, take care of their needs first, and then think about how they took care of their families and then the community so that when they went out into the wider community, if you know how to take care of yourself and your family, then you can take that out into the wider community. So learning to take care of themselves so that they felt good about themselves. Um, there were the simplest things like, obviously, um, you know, hair type and skin colour. Everything was right. 
mm. you know. And uh, I think the fact that I chose to wear my hair in a very sort of natural style kind of um, kind of challenged those who believe that you've got to westernise your hair to fit in, to feel like you can be accepted. Um, so modelling me being a role model in that kind of way and then celebrating the children and their hair types no matter what kind of hair they had and they knew you know the one big difference is some hair grows out and some hair grows down but hair's beautiful and that's and so it, it was that kind of stuff um it was celebrating skin color um and um not wanting any of the white community to apologize for anything and to embrace their whiteness in the same way that we wanted the black kids to embrace their blackness and be proud of uh, the depth of color in their skin um so you know it was things on a practical level um it was things like thinking about what they wore so that um you know we weren't we weren't restricting girls into um, passive play because of the shoes that they wore or the fact that they wore a dress. They could wear those things if they wanted to, but it wasn't enforced um, because I, I always wanted children to come to school. That was my rule. You know, our school shoe rule was um, no logos, branding, because we're not doing that kind of stuff. And secondly, shoes you can play in. That's what's important because child is about play. <laughs> wear clothes and shoes that you can play in. Um, so that was the key thing. Um, the other big thing that uh, the other big thing that we did was um, wanting to know the children properly, like really know them. So they weren't empty vessels that came for us to fill, um, but it was very much. I mean, our strap line was that it takes a whole village to raise a child. So thinking about how you walk, work in partnership with their parents and the extended community, so that those children. Uh, felt valued by absolutely everyone um, and uh, one of the so instead of doing pupil progress meetings uh, not pupil progress meetings but instead of doing um, uh, one to one profile meetings for children who were on the uh, send register saying that actually everyone needed to have those one to one meetings and making those meetings possible during the school day um, and getting the parents to understand how important their voice was so that they could be part of a proper conversation with their child and uh, the class teacher just one-on-one -on -one, rather than that five-minute conversation once a term in front of lots of other people when you couldn't be honest um, and those conversations were usually led by the children where they could show their parents what they were doing really well and what they most wanted to be doing next so that the parent was then aware of what their child was successful at. The child knew what they were successful at. And that's really important. Children need to know what they're good at. Um, and then it meant that the parent and the child and the school could come together to work on whatever the next step was, irrespective of that. Um, and the other thing that we really wanted to do was to celebrate cleverness. So um, I think this was the key thing for us. I think this is the key reason why we were as successful as we were. So at the moment, we have this very narrow de definition of educational success. And that is, if you're good at English, maths and science, you're clever. Mm. Okay. If you're good at anything else, uh, you're not clever. And we, so we have all of these people who leave school saying that they weren't successful in school because maybe they were great at art or design or music um, or um, uh, outdoor learning or, you know, showing leadership in those sorts of things. We don't measure those things at all because we deem them to be add-ons. We call it the extended curriculum rather than the curriculum. Um, and so uh, it means that for the kids who are great at English, maths and science, they leave school feeling clever. And we also promise them that they're going to go out into the world and they're going to live happily ever after because they're going to be the A-star kids who get these, uh, these jobs, which guarantee success and happiness, which is a load of rubbish because how many doctors and how many accountants do we know who went through the system as A-star kids who absolutely hate what they do, who are as miserable as hell? So we've, we've lied to those kids. But we also lied to the other children 
by saying they're not so clever. And often what we do is, do you know what, Victoria, you're not very good at spelling. So what we're going to do is you may be great at art, but during art lessons, we're going to give you extra time to, you know, become better at spelling rather than giving you the opportunity to become a celebrated artist in the community. And that's what we do to the children. We say, you're not good at maths. So during PE or during music or during design and technology, when you can shine, we're not going to give you that opportunity to shine. We're going to make you do double what you feel like you're failing. And so those kids leave school feeling like they can't learn. They're not successful. And what I wanted to do was for us to know what every child was good at and give them an enhanced opportunities to become better at what they're good at. Because I absolutely believe that everyone has the potential to reach greater depth in something. And it's our job to unlock that key and working with the parent and with the child, saying, what are you really great at? How are we going to enhance that? How are we going to um, organize the curriculum so that you can feel like a successful learner? And then the consequence of that was that your children began to realize everybody was clever. We had that rule, everybody was clever. Mm. And um, it then meant that children took risks in their learning. They didn't mind getting things wrong in maths and then working hard to make it come right because they knew they were clever. Because at the moment, the only people who take risks in their learning are those who think they're already clever. The others start becoming risk adverse. And you can't have leaders who are risk adverse. It doesn't work. So all we're doing is um, putting stumbling blocks in the way of children's true potential. And then we get to the end of schooling when they maybe go off on school journey for their one week away. And we think, my God, they can do leadership or they're really good at supporting and helping others. Or it's the, you know, the leavers play and suddenly we realise they can sing or they can do scenery or they can do dancing. We don't want to be learning about what kids are good at when they leave school. We want to do that when they're in school so that we can build their self-esteem. Um, and uh, yeah, because that's what we placed an emphasis on. Our children went on to do incredibly well in all of their learning because they knew they were clever. And that is belonging. It is, it is, isn't it? And celebrating us all for our differences is, is so, so important. And, you know, this, this, this thing about failure, I think, is something that I find really, really interesting. And, and kind of our cultural approach to failure is, and a blame culture that we have within the UK is quite phenomenally um, debilitating for everybody, really. Because if you're, if you're so terrified of failing and of being blamed for something you're not going to take risks and then how are we going to be the best people that we can be or to you know develop our country and to do better or whatever we want to do how are we going to do that if we're terrified of taking taking any risks and it comes back to you know the work of Carol Dweck doesn't it and the growth mindset you know it's so fundamental and there's so much research behind it and so many schools say oh yeah we do growth mindset we had a course on that but there aren't many schools that really do it. So can you tell us what is it like to really live a growth mindset in a school um, where failure is not as is, is learning opportunity rather than something to be avoided? Um, so what you do in a school, so you've got this growth mindset. I think it really is about, um, one, working with your staff. Because um, obviously staff will have understood schooling in a more traditional kind of way. And so getting your team on board to understand what success looks like, to understand what a, a growth mindset looks like, um, and to understand success in a different kind of way. Um, and then once you uh, take your team with you, you can then see them working with the children and getting them to understand what, um, what, their, own, um, what their own growth mindset looks like. Um, I find it really interesting um, that we talk about these things. Well, I'm just looking to see when she wrote it, and I've got a feeling it was a long time ago because I can remember learning about her stuff when I was just a really, really 
young teacher. And so I think it's it's actually getting everyone to recognize mistakes are part and parcel of life mm. and that we can grow through our mistakes. It's our best learning. And when you realize that failure is your best learning, then that kind of, you know, flips the narrative completely. So rather than failure, getting something wrong means that you're a failure. Getting something right, if you flip the narrative, it means that you're on your way to becoming more successful because you want to overcome whatever it is that wasn't okay um, so that you can be more informed, you can be stronger, you can be better. I mean, we talk all the time about wanting to to develop resilience. Mm. Well, why do you want to talk about resilience being one of your core values if you don't want kids to make mistakes? Yes. That doesn't make sense to me. (laughs) That's not true. (laughs) So you're a failure because you could be um, you could be um, an A star kid, but you get, keep getting these silly little things wrong, and so we're going to beat you up for that. But and then we say that child needs to develop their resilience. It just shows people don't understand their growth mindset. It fits hand in hand with um, with uh, with growth and um, yeah. So yeah, important that resi- in order. It's that resilience piece. And it's that for me, it's about recognizing the fear of looking at that learning pit and realizing that you can't do something. Because often you kind of go through life not knowing that you can't do something. And then you have this kind of awakening, like, oh, okay, this is something new that I need to learn. And there's that fear in the pit of your stomach where you're facing down this kind of learning pit. I've got to jump in there and I've got to feel really vulnerable in order to climb out the other side, because there's no way to kind of scoot over the top. And, and, and if we can help young people to recognize that that is okay, it's part of the process, that jumping in that pit takes courage, that that's what it is to be a resilient person. If we can talk about that every day, if we can model it as adults, if we can make mistakes and we can sort them out and work through them and learn from them, then that is what we need to be doing to develop, I feel, to develop these growth, real growth mindset schools where failure is celebrated. And it's not just who's won an award this week, it's who's had a who's had an epic fail that have managed to overcome it, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, let's talk about that as part of it. And yeah. you, keep, you keep mentioning a word, <laughs> which <laughs> or a phrase, which I think is really interesting. And um, I'm going to say something a bit controversial now, but you say, you know, you use the word be- beating children up when you're talking about the way that we kind of discriminate against children and tell them that they're bad and you shame and punishment to try and get them to behave better or whatever it is. But it's something that I've realised over the last kind of 18 months or so is that that metaphor that you're using, the beating up, if it was physical, what we were doing to children within, within the system, it would be illegal and people would be in jail for it. But we're doing it, you can't see it because it's mental. And so the approach that we have within our system is damaging young people. And yet we're allowed, we allow it to continue. Yeah. (laughs) Um, It's, yeah. So let's just talk a little bit about that because I think it's controversial, but I think it's important that we talk about it. But it is, of course, it's abusive to tell somebody that they're failing because they're not learning your way. Your, de- your definition of a successful learner is the definition rather than the fact that everybody's got the potential to be a successful learner. Um, it's, um, it's punishing kids because, um, because they don't have tidy hair. Um, so, you know, so many kids come away from school thinking, ap- apologising for their hair. Um, because we've allowed them to think that they've got, you know, I, 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 you know, and that's me as well. When I was a, a little girl, I had to have my hair in two neat plaits um, because hair like this was deemed to be messy, untidy, dirty, all of those sorts of things. Um, and that gets into your head and you believe that's who you are. Um, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I think that instead of us building kids up to believe that they are wonderful and successful and genius and um, fantastic contributors and all that kind of stuff, we alienate them constantly by telling them everything that they do wrong all the time. We've got this deficit model 
um, of assessing for failure rather than assessing for success. We don't assess for success. Um, and then, you know, on the, the flip side of it is if you if you are really good at something, you're not allowed to say it because then it's boasting or it's showing off or, mm -hmm. do you know, we, we it, so it's just like you can't win. You can't be too clever and you can't be, you, you can't sort of be neurodiverse in any kind of way because that is, um, it's just, there is no understanding. And these are people who go through teacher training, they understand about growth mindsets, they understand about resilience, they understand about um, self-esteem and all of those sorts of things. Everybody looks at Maslow's triangle. Every single person does Maslow's triangle as part of their teacher training. And then they go into school to tell children, I'm gonna put lots of X's against the things that you do wrong because that's more important than all the things that you've got right. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, in my view, that is an abusive way of bringing young people up. And, you know, people sort of say, well, didn't do me any harm. I went through the education system. Well, you know what? Let's just stop and look at how wonderful the world is at the moment. Not, you know, we've got, we've got some really ugly behavior going on around us. Uh, we've got some, uh, we've got a re real lack of community cohesion. We, we can be really uncaring and intolerant of each other. Um, we want everybody to conform in a particular way. Um, we're not modeling um, good values in the way that we need to be modeling it. Um, so we could be better humans. We mm -hmm. can be better humans and we've got to, you know, you're not going to be a good human if you've been made to feel like you're failing all the time. Exactly, exactly. And the neuroscience research is also really clear on, on all of this is that the, the brain can only flourish and, and, and develop um, in an optimal way if the, the, the young person is, uh, or that, for that matter, an older person, because we can all learn and develop um, at any age. But if the, the person who's developing uh, feels safe, um, has well rested, exercised, um, has has connection with other people around them you know that it's it's so clear and that's where it kind of links into the Maslow's as well but the, the neural pathways within the brain that help us to to learn and develop cannot be formed if our brain is living in that fight flight or free state that we are in if we are being abused and let's just call it what it is the system currently for many many children is abusing them it's causing them to feel that they are less or they're not good enough. And that's why we have a mental health crisis because children are being told that they are not good enough. And that is, I, I feel that we will look back on this time, Alison, the way that we do slavery now and think how on earth could people have allowed that to happen to young people? So I get quite, quite emotional when I say that. Mm. But I just, when you know, when you understand this stuff, when you've been through it, when you understand there's a different way to doing it, it just feels so sad to me that we continue to allow this to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we do have a mental health crisis. And people want to say it's because children aren't resilient enough. But yeah, we're killing. We're killing the spirit in our young people. And I can remember when I was doing my A-levels, you know, maybe... Not even every year, someone, you, you'd kind of whisper about the occasional person who got three A's. And we now in a system where children get a B and they think they failed because they've got a B. Um, and, and just to prove that as well, because children started working so hard to get the A's, we then had to introduce A stars mm. because A's weren't good enough. So now let's have A stars. Let's raise the bar um, so that those who got A's no longer feel like they're successful because they're, you know, not as successful as the A star kids. So we constant, yeah, we just have this very sort of linear. Um, yeah, we've got a very sort of, I don't know, this old thing about putting kids into boxes and telling them, you know, that's who you are and you stay in that box and this is this is your place in the world is just so very sad and of course we're not preparing the kids for um for future lives in the way that we need to really because the system that we've got at the moment which is based completely on tick boxes um may have worked once in terms of getting places in university 
but universities are now much more interested in the interview and what a young person brings to the table. Um, employers at one point would have been interested in um, grades, universities and all of those sorts of things. You know, I, I took on a community manager for my platform quite recently and um, we didn't look at that at all. They had to do, you know, like an online psychometric test. And I was really interested in the values that they would bring to the organization, all those sorts of things. I didn't know their gender. I didn't know their grades. I didn't know which university they'd been to, any of those sorts of things. But we were measuring something else. And that for me was a sharp learning curve because I think this is what more and more employers are going to do because you want people who are good people who can bring good values, who are going to bring uh, critical thinking skills, who are going to bring creativity to the table. That's the kind of person that I want to employ rather than someone who's maybe got, um, you know, uh, a B in maths GCSE. Yes, they do need to be able to do some kind of maths. Um, but what's more important are the, the skills that they can bring to the organisation because that maths at GCSE isn't necessarily going to make us a great organisation, but critical thinking is. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, the other bit is that most of the children in our education system right now aren't going to be employed. The days of employment are gone. So what we're doing is saying, you've got to work really, really, really hard so you can get a job. No. <laughs> you've got to work really, really hard and understand yourself and know what you're good at because you're going to have to go out as a self-employed individual and you're going to have to hustle for your existence. You, you need to be able to network. You need to be able to embrace differences and you need to be able to feel like you can go anywhere in the world where your skills are, are um, going to be the most valued because of what who you are and what you bring to the table. Um, so it's, it's another line, you know, we're not thinking about what the world's going to look like over the next 25 years. We're looking at what the world used to look like in the 70s. And so we go on with the 70s approach, if you like. Um, and of course, we're not going in that direction. So yeah, yeah, we're letting everybody down. We are, we are, we're still perpetuating the kind of industrial revolution when we've moved on though. I think we're in the fourth industrial revolution now, but we're still in the same it, one iteration of the education system. It really hasn't changed. And it's so sad that we are letting our, our children down to this extent. Um, so I'm going to encourage them. We've got quite a few people online with us. If there's any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A because we'd love to answer those. Um, but I, I wanted to get back to, to your school again because I know people love the practicalities of, of how you manage to, to achieve these things. So you, you had a few things that you talked about earlier, um, which I thought were really important. Um, talking about things being led by children and choice being important and play. So can you talk to us more about how you incorporated that in your, your kind of everyday school um, when you were leading it? Uh, yeah, so the thing that people don't like me saying, school leaders especially, is um, instead of doing English and maths five days a week, we didn't. We uh, did it three days a week. And then on the fourth day, it was uh, the practical use of those skills. So it was pro problem solving, problem solving day or extended writing day. But the children knew what they were going to be writing about. And they wrote these amazing, I mean, their writing was just so bloody fabulous. It was ridiculous. Um, and that meant that we had a fifth day where we could um, do all of the, where we could do uh, something that was more um, individualized. Um, so there was that. Uh, we had um, everybody did forest school because I think that it's really important to um, do outdoor learning. It affects mood. Um, there are some children who are very successful learning outside, but not necessarily inside. Um, so it, uh, it was important that everyone had access to an, uh, a forest school curriculum rather than it being uh, once a year. Well, you know, year six is going away for a field trip you know, and it, after they finish their SATs, which is really, you don't gain anything from that. The school doesn't gain. Um, and um, the other thing that people would always say is that there isn't enough time. So it's only early years to get to forest school. All of the children need outdoor learning. Um, the other bit was that I didn't like the children being punished for um, losing their play for bad behavior. Um, it's just counterproductive. <laughs> they 
need they need to be kids so that they can then come back in a more sort of wholesome way so that you could then talk through whatever's gone wrong mm. um and it also meant that the children could be much more responsible for their own behaviors um whereas if they're really stressed and angry and sad because they weren't allowed to play then that just doesn't make any kind of sense um so there was that um, in terms of, the, I mean, we did have sanctions and stuff. So, for example, if someone lost their cool um, playing football, then they automatically lost their right to play football for the rest of that term. And they would come to me and uh, they, were, they, you know, it's just like, what happened? It's just like, well, I got really, really angry in football and I didn't mean to. It's just like, yeah, but, you know, what's the consequence? It's like, I can't play football. It's just like, OK, so where are you going to play instead? You can't play football, you know, the so you can play, and then it's big table tennis, whatever. And they'd accept it. Mm. And of course, if football is really important to them, they'd learn self-regulation in a different kind of way. Mm. So I didn't beat them up. And, and so, yes, actually doing a load of work with the kids around self-regulation was important. Um, adults, you can see the adults around us who have never learned self-regulation. They're not nice people. So, um, yeah, we need to give the children um, an opportunity to learn that. Um, we also did mindfulness, um, and it started off with, um, well, it started off with me um, hitting the wall. We didn't always do this stuff. Um, I hit the wall, I wasn't very well, um, and then I needed to learn to be responsible for my own being well. Mm. Uh, and so I started investigating a bit more and became interested in mindfulness and all that kind of stuff. And then kind of thought, well, you know what? If I'm feeling this stressed and tired and um, undervalued and all of those sorts of things, then everybody is. Mm. Because whatever was happening to me was going to, I was replicating that, you know. Um, and so I then um, spoke to the governors about it and it was agreed that we'd start embracing well-being in a proper way. Um, and that meant that we offered, um, when we started with mindfulness, it was optional. Um, and you know just with the staff and then um and then we started doing it with children and then it just became the thing and it wasn't long it was um as uh, the other thing was not bothering with lining up I mean how much time do we make kids line up for you can't go in until you're quiet it's just like but your learning's really important but you can't come in until you're quiet it's just like well let them walk in calmly and quietly and allow them to self-regulate walking up the stairs by themselves without walking up in silence in a row which is just such an unnatural way to walk through the world. We don't, you know, you want to teach children to walk properly rather than walk in a straight line in silence. So that's what I mean by sort of offering those opportunities for self-regulation. So the children just used to walk into school, which saved us time. And then uh, as soon as the, the day started, they started with a uh, few minutes of um, mindfulness, which they took in turns to lead. And we understood it in different kinds of ways. So sometimes it was sitting in silence. Uh, sometimes it was um, being led through a guided meditation. And the kids were really good at doing guided meditations, you know, leading the group. Sometimes it used to be kind of standing, so you were holding a tree. Sometimes it would be um, lying down, listening to music, but, you know, because mindfulness is a unique experience. And so getting children to think about all of that kind of stuff. And also learning the power of breath and the, learning, the power of silence, but also learning how to calm yourself down. So we used to do, the, the thing that I've been showing people quite a lot is things like, um, I do it for myself. If I feel really, really stressed, uh, it takes 20 seconds where you breathe in mm. and you breathe out. And you breathe in and you breathe out. And by the time you've got to your fifth finger and you've taken five breaths in, five breaths out, you feel different. Um, and and so children learned how to calm themselves down because and and then the other way was understanding anger and recognizing that we all have those sorts of emotions. So getting children to understand all of those sorts of things is an important part of learning. The other thing we had was um, diet. Yeah, you know, understanding that what you put into your body is as good as what you you know you can't perform well if you don't put good stuff in. Um, and so starting off with water only policy where parents said their children were going to die of thirst because they weren't bringing in you know the blue fizzy drinks which are really popular for a while it's like no they're not going to die um, <laughs> if they're thirsty they will drink water and after a while all the children were just drinking water and it was completely fine um and then we moved through to becoming a vegetarian school not because um 
not because I think that vegetarian food is more is healthier it's cheaper um so um I had a school cook who was really great and she and I would go through cookery books and we would uh choose a, a really nice menu we had a dietitian who looked at the menu that we were offering uh we didn't get the children to fill up on bread but if they were still hungry they could have as much vegetables as they wanted to we didn't do desserts they could have um as much fruit as they wanted to um you know and there were some kids who didn't want to eat the vegetarian food for whatever reason it's just like oh do you know do you fancy a yogurt and uh, um a banana completely fine that's a great lunch I can go you know and they'd, they'd be fine with that and then of course they'd come back and and try things we used to do bush tucker trial when we introduced new food it's just like <laughs> I don't eat vegetarian pizza you don't okay well you don't have to but you know you can here's a little tiny square and we'll put it you know and let's do your bush tucker trial so you could try and eat a vegetarian pizza and then of course they realized it's okay because it was a game so um doing all of those sorts of things it saved an awful lot of money um it was also getting the children to understand belonging so um, I insisted on lots and lots. I mean, the beauty of living in London, you public transport is free for children. So getting them out so that London became their London and they knew about the museums and the galleries and the parks and the iconic buildings um, and also getting positive role models in. Um, and I just want to say something about positive role models, which is going to be really uh, controversial. So the positive role models needed to be as diverse as the world is. So yes, it was getting in um, the uh, young black guys who um, maybe got into trouble with the police when they were teenagers and then went to prison and then they discovered the importance of self-regulation and becoming good people. And, uh, and so they now go into schools talking about the fact that you don't have to carry, the, carry a knife to be cool. Um, but it was equally important to get the black guy in who was a pilot. So that the children recognized that blackness was not about going wrong and then coming right. But blackness is, um, there's this wider spectrum of black success as there is white success. It was getting um, the women architects in. It was getting, um, uh, it was getting young. I had a pupil, I always remember her, Kerry. I met her in Sainsbury's and she was like, oh, do you remember me? And she's just like, yeah, I remember you, but you can't call me Miss anymore. And uh, she and she was this uh, young mom, and she told me she, you know, she was thirty. She was a single mom, and she was doing mobile hairdressing. And I said, said, "Oh God, will you come and talk to the kids?" And she said, "No, why? You know, I'm a failure. You know, I'm a single mom, and all of this kind of stuff." It's like, no, you are bringing two kids up really successfully. Their kids were there with them; they were all wonderful, really amazing kids. You know, you've got these two wonderful children that you brought into the world who are brilliant, and if you're a mobile hairdresser. Who's doing your accounts? Who's mixing up your chemicals? Who's who set up your business? So that means you are a successful person. So can you please come and talk to the children about being a single mom and someone who's running a business successfully because she was able to sustain herself? Because not everybody's going to go off and become a doctor. You know, being a doctor is in the pinnacle of career success. Doing what you're good at and getting joy earning your living in that kind of way is the pinnacle of success and getting the kids to understand that's what happiness looks like so yes talking about happiness in a very open and transparent way mm, yeah so powerful it's so so important you know that we broaden our children's horizons and that they have they can see the opportunities that because there's so many wonderful opportunities not just in this country but globally and further afield probably as well you know who knows where these children are going to be working in the future who knows which galaxy it's going to be on who knows but you know it's <laughs> it's it's amazing what you know if we can if we can just get children to see the potential that they have then the sky's the limit for them and I think if we constantly dampening down their aspirations their self-esteem um, with the way that we talk to them with the way that we kind of don't celebrate their the things that they're good at and then of course you know then they're, they're not going to reach their potential so yeah, yeah. you actually raise an important point so 25 percent of children are going to migrate mm -hmm. so for them to be able to go and work success successfully in other countries then they need to i mean you know i know we both uh, lived in more than one country it takes a certain courage to be able to do that mm -hmm. 
So let's give that, you know, let's let's pretend that every single child has that opportunity. So what skills do we need to do? They need to be able to accept difference. Um, they need to want to take risks with language. They need to be wanting to try different foods. They need to want to talk to strangers and people who don't look like them. In fact, the more diverse your curriculum, the more diverse your your educators are, your, the more diverse the people that you bring into the school for the children to see, the more diverse your community in every sense of the way, the better the opportunities are to go out into a world and become part of, um, of the, you know, they, they, they'll understand global success in a different kind of way. So keeping things samey and safe, um, all you're doing is limiting opportunity. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I refer back to a mentor of mine who, who has a great catchphrase, says, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. And you, you have to do things differently. And we've been doing it since the 1850s or wherever they first came up with the curriculum. And we, we're still getting the same outcomes as we had then, but they're not relevant anymore. It's The world has changed completely it's you know imagine if someone from the 1850s was kind of beamed in their kind of um travel um time travel machine to, to now they would just wouldn't could not understand how we were talking on a zoom and you know all these kind of things the world has completely changed so these children need to be adaptable flexible they need to be creative they need to be courageous you need to have so much courage um to, to have a growth mindset all these things um but you know living in a blame culture and a shame culture where it's constantly looking over your shoulder what am I going to get wrong next is never going to be a way that these young people are going to develop and the system that we have just in its essence the way it's examined at GCSE and A level with this normal curve that was only really exposed to the general public back last summer wasn't it not the one that's just been but the one before when they they lined everyone up from from the top to the bottom and then gave people grades based on that and everyone was like that's not fair and I was like yes that's how they do it every year you just see how they do it now <laughs> yeah and that's not Absolutely. how it works yeah, yeah. do you, you yeah, had, yeah but sorry go for it the, the other thing that I think is really interesting I, I love the qualities that you just talked about in terms of success um, but the other thing that I think we see in our young people now that we don't give them enough credit for is compassion. Um, mm. there, I, I do think that young people are more compassionate. And I can remember a guy called Henry Allingham um, coming to visit the school. And he was the oldest man in the world. He was in the Guinness Book of Records. And he was 116. Um, and um, he came to visit because it used to be his primary school. And the children um, asked him, um, whether they were as bad as people say they were, which is heartbreaking, isn't it? Are we really this bad? You know, were the kids in the olden days nicer children? And he said, no, you nicer people now because we were horrible to each other, the way in which, and he talked to them about how blatantly racist people were when he was a little boy. And, and I'm not, you know, you, we know racism exists now, but it's not as... Um, you know, we don't have the, you know, no blacks, no Irish, uh, no dog signs anymore. Um, it might be there in a different kind of way, for sure. I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, pretend that racism doesn't exist because we, we know it definitely does. But what he was saying is that young people today are much more accepting of each other than they were. And of course we are. I mean, let's look at, you know, our approach to, um, to enhance, you know, accepting sexuality, for example, whereas before that was something that we were ashamed of. Now we've got to a point where, um, you know, we're not there yet, but there is greater acceptance within a group of kids now that, you know, if a kid says they're gay, then they're gay, that's it, that's fine. It's, yeah, exactly. Alison, can you believe we've been chatting for an hour already? It's just flown by and um, thank you so much for your time today and I'm sure everyone online with us now will also extend those thanks I think it's been so eye-opening and stimulating to have this lovely chat with you um it's always been wonderful to connect with you because we have we share so many of the same values and ideas about the future of education um and I'm just excited about what's going to happen next steps and where the future of education is going to take us so I encourage people to watch this space and um, see see what might happen next. Um, Alison, do you want to say any last words before we finish up? Yes, I think that you're doing amazing things and I'm really, 
really glad and felt that you invited me to be part of your show. And um, I know that we'll, you know, we've got work to do, you and I, and we will, we, we need to make sure we focus on that ball and keep going forward. Um, but I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. Oh, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for those that have joined us. I'm going to say adieu. And thank you for those of you that are watching us um, online um, after the event. Please do share this recording with anyone you think might find it interesting. Thanks so much. <laughs>